fasting um, is awesome. I, I, I think fasting leads to my superpowers. So, um, you know, we could do, we could do probably five straight shows on fasting, but my, my response about fasting is it leads to superpowers and it does so through a very interesting physiological response that your body has to fasting. I think fasting is, is, uh, most people think of as fasting as a kind of a weight loss strategy, but that, that's, that's sort of like saying you go to school to learn how to dress cool. <laughs> no, you go to school to become educated. You fast to improve your health. And it's, if you're looking at it just from a weight loss perspective, you're looking at it myopically, short-sightedly. The real focus and the benefit on fasting is through autophagy. And autophagy is the process by which cells repair and clean themselves up, repair damage. And so you, you want to be the healthiest collection of cells you can possibly be by addressing the health of every individual cell. And that happens the best that I can think of as a health optimizing physician through autophagy. And so when you fast linearly in a direct relationship, the longer you fast, the more autophagy you get to at least about 72 to maybe 96 hours. That's my Goldilocks recommendation for fasting. And right now, I don't know, I'm not 100% confident, but I do this myself. So, you know, as a health optimized physician trying to nail it, I do that every week. Once a week, three days to four days I fast. And then uh, I do that. So about four times, uh, four times a month, I'm doing that. So almost half the month, uh, I am I am fasting in that in that particular state, and uh, we can measure autophagy um, through a, a a a cell model called uh, chaperone mediated autophagy activity. It's abbreviated CMA activity, and there's an interesting study back in 2021 that looked at stroke patients. And I attended a funeral just a few hours ago for a woman that ultimately died from a stroke, and it was her second one. And if you're a physician, either an ER physician uh, or a neurologist or a, a primary care doctor, you know when you hear stroke, you think of one other thing, the next stroke. It just happens. Why? Because we are bad at managing reversing that disease process. And so you have one stroke, you end up having other strokes. And so this woman had two and ulti ultimately it, it con contributed to her, caused her demise. So uh, what we find in this marker is the people that had the most amount of autophagy never stroked again. And the ones that had the high, the, the, uh, the least amount of autophagy, they always stroked again. And that study should be in every medical practitioner's office, and it, sh it should be in every med school, and everybody listening today should be saying, my God, I want to do autophagy, because uh, I'm an ER doctor. Uh, I I've seen all manners of death, gunshots, stabbings, cancer, strokes, bleeds, uh, all different ways, you know, motor vehicle accidents, you could die. And there's only one, the one at the top, if you ask me, the one I do not want to die from is a stroke. I don't want to have a stroke because I don't want to be, I, I, if you haven't figured it out uh, by now, Dr. Sean likes to think about things. <laughs> I enjoy my brain. I leverage it. And I don't want to be somebody that's laying in a bed, drool coming out of my mouth. And I don't understand uh, uh, my wife when she comes and tells me, I love you, Sean, um, or my children, uh, or I can't say that to other people, or I can't read a study. And so I want to preserve my brain and a stroke steals, steals your brain from you. So I do not want to have a stroke. So I practice fasting. I love autophagy. And when you get into these longer fasts, is there anything you do specifically to increase autophagy like exercise or other? Yeah, man. Yeah. What a great question. That's when I get it on. My longest fast at the end is when I'm doing my biggest workouts. So when I break my fast and I'm feasting, I don't even exercise because then I want all my blood flow, not going to my muscles, but to my gut. 
get on the business of digesting that. But when I'm working out, I'm fasting, uh, I'm exercising, my blood is not going to my gut. It's available to go to my muscles, and that's where I crush it. I do my most taxing, most difficult workouts uh, during fasted states. All right. Coming back to the five strategies, we've touched on all of them. I know we only have a few more minutes. We'll end on this. For people that have been hanging on the edge of their seat, they're drinking, say, a glass or two of wa- a wine per week, or it could be any amount of alcohol. Is there a certain amount that isn't damaging when it comes to visceral fat? Um, I won't, st- I, yeah, I'll have to say that uh, there's no amount that isn't damaging to a certain degree. Uh, there, but here's the question if I have a client who's coming to me and says, I'm going to drink some alcohol. What's the best form of alcohol? What's the best way I can do this with the least amount of damage? So here's the answer I get. The least amount of damage, but there's going to be damage, um, is you drink a red Cabernet Sauvignon, a very dry wine, Cabernet Sauvignon, lowest amount of alcohol, uh, probably has um, the most amount of, you know, more, a little bit more benefit, more benefit than other forms of alcohol and less uh, less harm to it. So that's the least evil. But, you know, just understand um, alcohol does not improve your life. There is no Olympic athlete that, you know, the best Olympic coaches say, you know, my God, you're not drinking. Let's change that. Start drinking. Nobody's going to do that. It is not going to improve your performance. But if you live a life where, you know, you just decided, you know, it's more more important to you to have a glass of wine with your wife uh, or, you know, to have, you know, a drink with your best friend, uh, then you be optimally healthy. Then I would tell you, have a little red wine um, and I, I would pair it with some steak. They can work well together. Um, and and, and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is probably the way to go. All right. And last question, caffeine, while we're talking about drinks and controversial ones. Are you somebody that drinks coffee, tea, has caffeine? Cold brew coffee. <laughs> okay, right there. And what about on a regular day versus fasting? Yeah, so um, I do oftentimes drink uh, coffee on a fasting day, uh, but I also do about half my fast uh, with uh, just water, and I won't drink with, uh, with coffee. So I'm ex- exploring that. And I find the fast with that coffee more beneficial because they're more taxing. So, you know, um, there's a principle, we never mentioned it, but a lot of my strategies are hormetic in nature, meaning that which does not kill you makes you stronger. So uh, if you, you know, have a, if you can make your fast more tough because you're exercising more, uh, you're, you're, you're creating more demand, uh, you you wear blood flow restriction devices when you're exercised. All these things are, have a hormetic principle. So, um, but yet I still uh, enjoy c- coffee and I follow the studies. And it looks like it is very beneficial for eliminating atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. About four to five cups a day, um, ideally paired with two to three cups of green tea, uh, with um, you know, without sugar being added to it. And it looks like the polyphenolic compounds are what are causing the benefit. And they appear to be uh, enhanced when they're consumed with protein. So it might mean that you should be consuming your coffee with some protein. Um, My favorite pairing to do with that right now is kefir. So I drink some kefir in advance of my coffee. So when it goes down there, it's, I got some kefir in there uh, to pair with that coffee. And sometimes I drink it with heavy cream, you know, which has protein in it and a lot of fat and less carbohydrates. And so that can be beneficial, I think, sometimes too. But I never pair it uh, with, with, with kefir or any calories when I'm fasting. There are calories about uh, anywhere from five to 10 calories in a cup of coffee, uh, but they're, they're minuscule. Uh, you get a pure, better fast if you drink, if you do in a zero calorie fast, but the small little bit, and I liken it this way, Jesse, if we, if we fasted because we couldn't hunt an animal, nobody volitionally fasted 100,000 years ago is because we didn't get an animal when we were hunting. Well, we would have drank water in a stream and occasionally we would have gotten some 
maybe small microscopic organisms in there. And uh, maybe we got a few calories in there. So I think it's, it's probably, probably okay. I mean, at least I'm telling myself that. Five to 10 calories uh, and a cup of coffee on a fast day. Um, I, I, the pluses, minuses, I'm going with the coffee. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. Nothing that I'm aware of as a physician whose passion is to help people become the best biological versions of themselves possible to optimize their health.